Woo. Okay, 16 years ago, say 16 years ago. 16 years ago, God took me to the throne room in heaven. Hallelujah. And it was on Pentecost Sunday, by the way. So I just celebrate my 16th year of being caught away. I was privileged to be there for nearly five hours. I still don't know everything that happened, everything that we said to each other, everything that I saw. I didn't really go anywhere except the throne room. I just saw the things that happened around the throne, and that's enough. Mm. That's more than enough, right, Papa? Over, above, and beyond. Amen. Anything you can ask or think, hallelujah. Whoo! And during that time that I was there, three days later, I'm laying in my bed, and still soaking in the afterglow. I couldn't speak for three days. All I could say is, holy. Al, he's holy. Worthy. That's the only two words I could say when I could talk for three days. Uh, Al took me, put me in a wheelchair and rolled me back into service that night. And a young man came up to me and his father said, uh, father, his grandfather said, he's been bitten by a, rec, a, a brown recluse spider. Look at his arm. I want you to pray for him. I didn't have to pray for him. I just hugged him. And when I hugged him, it just immediately vanished and left his arm. Just from that afterglow, hallelujah, of what was on me. Whew. Man, it'd be wonderful to live in that, wouldn't it? In him we live and move and have our being. In us he lives and moves and has his expression. Amen? So that's why I tell everybody, I'm the Billy expression of Christ on the earth. And say your name. I am the... Go ahead and say it. It's your name. You are that expression of Christ on the earth. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whew. But anyway, three days later, I'm laying in the bed, and, and I just thought, I just thought, Jesus, you, you came off the throne, and, and you took a coal from the, from the altar there, and you put it on my lips, and I just thought, what was that for? And immediately the answer came back. How many of you know that... God is a spirit, and he communicates through us, to us and through us by our spirit man. And immediately he said to me, that's for how I'm going to use you in the last days. How many of you knows, know these are the last days? Last days. And so this is what he said. He knows I love alliteration, but listen to this. He said, that's for the way I'm going to use you, to preach, to pray, to prophesy, and to proclaim my word, my will, and my ways. And so you're going to get a little bit of that tonight. So everybody thinks there's a new anointing on me. If there is, that's the reason. Fresh coal from the lips, from my, for my lips. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So whew, my life has never been the same. And each day is a challenge. Have you, have you been challenged today? If you haven't, you will be. Life is full of challenges. But I'd like you to, to know that we teach from the three realms of the spirit, of the supernatural, based on the, the feasts of the Lord. And those feasts are ta pa Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Now, Passover, we just experienced in April. Passover speaks of the faith realm. Please, you're going to be able to take notes tonight. Passover speaks of the faith realm. That's when we're born again when we enter into the kingdom of God, when the blood of Christ is applied to our sin debt. We don't have to pay our debt. It's already been paid. Can you say amen? Woo, I'm happy already. I mean, that song got me in a realm, guys. We, we receive salvation by faith, and then we learn to walk in faith. Don't ever throw your faith away. You must have faith. Uh, Pop and I are trying to finish our book, Thine is the Glory. And the first chapter is Faith is the Foundation. And it's the foundation. So don't ever throw your faith away. You've got to have faith. Don't, don't say, oh, well, those faith people, they, they were wrong. They taught wrong. Name it, claim it, frame it, you know. But don't throw your faith away because there is a faith that is true and just and it's important. So we call this first day, but it's so important. It's foundational. And then we go on from Passover to Pentecost. Now, Pentecost speaks of the anointing. This is the anointing as Jesus told the disciples to wait for that power from on high that would come after he returned to heaven. 
and he sent the Holy Spirit to teach us and comfort and bring us revelation of everything Jesus said and did. And there's so much that the Holy Spirit does. You need to look at John 14 to be able to understand what Jesus taught the disciples about the Holy Spirit. It's so important. That's when the spiritual gifts are given. That's the second day. That's when the spiritual gifts are given by the anointing. And then the gift of faith operates by the Holy Spirit. We call this second day. That's how you get miracle signs and wonders. It's by the anointing, by the gifts of the spiritual gifts that God gave. And I could do a teaching on that too. Whew. Boy, this is good. And then, of course, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is third day, represents the glory realm. Can you say the glory realm? Everybody that's talking about it ain't been there. Everybody that's using vocabulary don't know what they're talking about. The, faith, the glory realm is not a woo 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 It is a person. He is the glory. I know you talk about a realm, but the realm is him. It's his presence. Hallelujah. And I love this. I'm going, someday I'm going to do a teaching about the presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T, from his presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. Hallelujah. Whew, that's where we learn to live in the finished work of Christ. Say it's done. One time I was getting ready to go to Adak, Alaska in 1977, my first trip out of the country. I was just a little Southern Baptist, Southern Fried Baptist back then. It wasn't hardly dry behind my ears, spiritually speaking. And God sent me to Adak, Alaska. It was actually written up in the Pentecostal Evangel, if you can believe it. <laughs> I went up there and established a church. They were expecting a fat little woman with a bun behind her back, you know, walking in going, hallelujah, praise God. And they, this is what they got, you know. I was about 40-something years old then, and I looked like a... <clears throat> yeah, I did. I did, and they went, wow, who is this? What is this? And boy, God, I was there for three weeks, and God just turned that island upside down. And every day, the, the runway was... Not, was uh, fought out. <laughs> Even the Monsignor made a declaration. Ever since this woman has come, you know, there's uh, the runway, excuse me, the, the uh, tower, tower of China. Yeah. What do you call the guy on the top of the tower? What do you call the guy that brings the airplanes in and out? Okay, wh whoever that is. He said, the Monsignor came and went, and, but ever since this lady came, the the runway has been thought out every day. And by the way, he got saved as a result. Remember, signs are for the unbeliever. It was a sign. Hallelujah. Woo. I got to stick to my notes or I'll start preaching for sure. Now, the glory realm is when we live in the realm of Christ's finished work. And this is considered the third day. Let's turn now our thoughts to the second feast, which is what? Pentecost. Joel prophesied. Didn't he? He predicted in Joel chapter 2. If you want to remember this now, Acts chapter 2 and Joel chapter 2 are parallels. And they're both speaking about Pentecost. And Joel prophesied that the former and the latter would be together. And he was speaking of harvest time. Can we proclaim together? It's harvest time. Say it with me. It's harvest time. Hallelujah. Yes, it is. The former and the latter are coming together. Now, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, according to Jesus' words to the disciple when he sent them out, we've been given power. Now, I want you to look at this now. If you're writing notes down, write the word power, and then beside it, write authority. And then he said, over all the power, say, write power again, but then write ability. Okay? So this is what Jesus said to us, that he had given us the authority over all of the ability of the enemy. Hallelujah, and the rest of that verse says, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Isn't that a good verse? Put that one in your pipe and smoke it. You're smoking everything else, you might as well get some real, real reed. Is it reed? Is that what they call it? Riff? Reef. See, I, you can tell I've never been around it. Hallelujah. Smoke. Some people call it smoking the Holy Ghost. I don't even like to say that. That's a little too familiar for my vernacular, but... Anyway, John records Jesus' last words in John 14. When he was getting ready to go away, he said to the disciples, they were not to be sad. 
How many of you know what it feels like when a loved one's getting ready to leave? You know, uh, our, our sister's getting ready to go to Germany to visit her mom. I've already told her, when you get ready to leave to take that baby back away, that your mom's going to be so sad to see you go away. There's going to be some tears coming out of her eyes. And the disciples were sad, but Jesus was telling them, don't be sad, I'm going away, because I must go so that he can come, right? He was talking about the third person of the Trinity, the blessed Holy Spirit. And he said he would explain. And then Jesus went on to explain the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives in chapter 14 there. But in Acts, there's the record of Jesus' promise of what would happen after he left. This is chapter 1, verse 8 of Acts, and I'm going to read it. And this is powerful. Here's another word of power. But you say I. You put your name in here. Every time I say you, you say me. Put your name in there. But Billy shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us. And Billy shall be witnesses to me. (laughs) He's talking about Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. Both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, so many people try to go to the uttermost parts of the earth before they've gone there, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. That's another sermon too, isn't it, Papa? How we went to our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria. For us, it was our our basement. That's where our school of the prophets was. These people that we taught are all over the world now. And then Samaria was our our surrounding areas. We started speaking in a glow chapter, full gospel businessmen. Then we started moving out to the East Coast and the West Coast, and then we went on television, and, well, then we started going to the nations. That's the way it was. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. God has a plan, and he has a purpose, and it's good for us to fit in with his plans. Amen? Some of you out there right now are listening to me right now, and you're looking for a solution to, you actually feel like you're in a dilemma. You don't know which way to turn. You don't know who to turn to. And I'm telling you right now, turn to God because he has a plan and a purpose for you. And his plan, he says, I know, there in Jeremiah, uh, excuse me, he said, I'm, yes, Jeremiah, he said, I know the plans I have for you. They're good and they're not evil. They give you a hope and a future. And he said, I know it's an expected end I have for you. And it's good. Hallelujah. How many of you rejoice in that? Knowing that God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. He has a destiny for you to fulfill. And look at me. I'm going to be 80 this year. Papa's 83, turned 83 in April. And we're not finished yet. We're still going. Hallelujah. As long as we have breath, we're going to go, Papa. As long as we, I told Papa last night, as long as we put one foot in front of the other, we're going. Amen. Another 40 years. Uh, another 40 <laughs> Don't prophesy, Michael. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's making the demand on God there. If God's, if God's finished, I'm finished, right? <laughs> Whoa. So, if we had to forego uh, any of the celebrations, like, for instance, we've just talked about, if we had to forego Christmas, Good Friday, Easter, or Pentecost, which we would call it, which one would seem less crucial to us? We'd find it difficult, wouldn't we, to picture a year with no Christmas, no Good Friday, no Resurrection Day. Many of us would say because of the congregational and cultural emphasis on the first three, well, if I must choose, I'll choose Pentecost. I could do without Pentecost. I can't say that. Maybe you could, but I can't. Without Pentecost, the other three would not be celebrated at all. There wouldn't, would not have been a Good Friday without the advent of Christ coming, which we celebrate at Christmas. Good Friday would not would have a meaningless martyrdom without the victorious resurrection of Jesus, which we celebrate at Easter. The world calls it Easter. We call it Passover. It is Pentecost that enables the gift of faith by which we can know that the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Christ is for us. Amen. 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 Jesus was not finished when he arose from the dead and ascended to be glorified. I thought that was shocking when the Holy Ghost had me write this, but listen to this. Only his work on earth as a man anointed by the Holy Ghost was finished. How many of you know he has a a work in heaven? Hmm? He's a high priest of our confession. Hmm? Isn't he, though? Woo! What else is he? He's ever living to make intercession for us. He's our advocate. Hallelujah. 
Oh, glory to God. I feel him right now. Thank you, Lord. He is our lawyer. Glory to God. He goes to bat for us. <laughs> Woo! He's the captain of our soul. Glory to God. He's right now, he is working. He's working right now. He's praying for me right now while I'm preaching. I mean, I thought I was going to teach. I hope I'm going to teach. <laughs> well, I'll let, let him do whatever he wants to. When he ascended to the Father, he sent the greatest gift of all, the gift of the Holy Spirit to live within us. This is so important. I try to make this clear now. Let me see if I can do it. The Old Testament saints, the Spirit came upon them, and they did mighty works or spoke for God. But now, say now. Huh. When are you living? Now. now. Jesus is telling the disciples and us. Remember when, the, when you're reading anything that he's saying to them, he's talking to us, right? I always make it personal. Jesus is saying to the disciples and us that the Holy Spirit will not just be with us. He will be what now? In us. Glory to God. And that he will abide in us. Whew. And it's with this excitement today that we'll focus on this aspect of receiving God's power. Now, mm, I want to jump ahead to ask you what you're going to do with it, but I'll just go ahead and try to teach first, lay a little more foundation. Okay, now, if you're taking notes, watch this now. I'm going to give you some outline. We are going to talk about the promise of the Pentecost, the posture of Pentecost, the picture of Pentecost, the preaching of Pentecost, and the practice of Pentecost. Are you hungry? <laughs> Say, give it to me, Mama. <laughs> all right, first of all, the promise of Pentecost. Jesus promised his disciples in Acts 1.8. He said, but you shall receive power. We just read that. After, when are you going to receive that power? After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then, he said, you'll be witnesses unto Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uttermost parts of the earth. And then in Joel, the prophecy came in the Old Testament. Joel chapter 2, here it is again now. Remember the parallels, Acts 1 and Acts 2. Joel 2, verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else and I love this, and my people, my people shall never be ashamed. Hallelujah. What a promise. My people shall never be ashamed. You see, shame is one of the biggest things we have to deal with in the sin nature and before we come to the Lord. And many times after, the, the enemy of our soul tries to bring us into shame and to... Now, shame, if, if, conviction is good. If the Holy Ghost is convicting us. But shame is from the enemy when he tries to tell us lies about ourselves and our condition if we are confessed up. Amen? And then verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit out upon all flesh. How many? How much is all? All is all. Isn't it? And your sons and your daughters and your grandchildren and your grandsons and your granddaughters and your great-grandsons and your great-granddaughters. Hallelujah! We got... Twelve grandchildren and fifteen greats. Hallelujah. <laughs> and they will all prophesy. And your old men, Papa, shall dream dreams. And your young men, Mark, shall see visions. Hallelujah. But some of us do both, don't we? We're young and old at the same time, right? <laughs> Those of us who are seers, we, we dream dreams and see visions, don't we? So in 29 it says, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days I will pour out my spirit. Didn't leave anybody out, did he? Hmm? And the verse 30, I will show wonders in the heavens. I say wonders. Oh, and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Uh, every year God gives me a prophetic word about the things he's going to do that year. Two years ago he told me that new earths were going to be, a new uh, planets were going to be, um, uh, discovered, and just this last week, I, I, did you see that on the internet about all the new uh, different things in the heavens that are, have been discovered on the, what is that, Hummel, Hummel, Hubble, help me, thank you, thank you, verse 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, we're hearing a lot about the blood moons now, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, mm. and verse 32, and it shall come to pass, that whosoever, who is a whosoever, any whosoever's out there, 
And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered, glory to God. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And the Lord hath said, in the, and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. My God, what a powerful scripture. Now, look at Peter's sermon in uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 20. I'm just going to give a lot of references, so jot these down. He quotes Joel ver verbatim right there when he's preaching. And so when we repent our sins and put our trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, we are promised Pentecostal power. I'm, I'm challenged to say it the way the Africans do, Papa. Power! <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, that's number one. What was number one? The promise of Pentecost. Number two? the people of Pentecost. This is the posture of a people who are ready to receive. Are you ready to receive? Your hands in your pockets, you know? I, I, I really enjoy watching uh, during worship. You can tell who the worshipers are. When the worship leader gets up and asks people to raise their hands, those who are worshipers have already got their hands up. You don't have to ask them to raise their hands, do you? They're not standing there looking around to see what everybody else has got on. They don't have their hands in their pockets. They didn't come to spectate. They came to participate. And those hands are in the air. Glory to God. Yes, they're worshiping the Lord. You don't have to tell a worshiper to raise their hands. Because they're building that realm. They're helping you build that realm. Amen? So, uh, Acts 1.14. God's power. Power. <laughs> These all continued with one accord. I, I could stop and make a joke here. My pastor likes to say they were all in one car. They all continued in one accord in prayer, and well, some of you will get that, and in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And then Acts 2, 1, and when the day of Pentecost was what? Fully come. For the last three years, God has been speaking to me about fullness, and I I don't have the revelation of all of it. And some of my sons, I've been saying to some of my spiritual sons, what does this mean, fullness, fullness? I know about the fullness of time Christ was born, but now they're preaching about fullness. So I just invite you to go ahead and ask the Lord what fullness means to you and see how much revelation you get on it yourself. Hallelujah. Whew. So when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. In, they were with one accord, not in one accord here. They were with one accord in one place. Today, there is a large number of people who are Christians. Huh. How many? We don't know. Because they say in, in China that thousands of people are getting born again every day. It's amazing. So only God's Geiger counter can keep up with it. His computer is better than ours, right? Why are we not impacting our world as we should? Why? I think of the, the word in the scripture where it says, Why sit we idle? Why are we sitting here doing nothing? Perhaps we're neglecting the posture of a people who are open to receive the fullness of that power. And listen to this now. That posture has four aspects. Number one, I'm going to give you the posture. Number one, they were all together in one place. This speaks of unity. Oh, my goodness. We could really preach here, couldn't we? We cannot go it alone in the Christian life. We need our brothers and sisters. There, sh there should be no lone rangers in the kingdom. You can't build alone. Can't, the Bible says, can two walk together except they agree? Even, you know, unity is necessary in marriage, in ministry, in business, and in any project that's going to succeed. There must be unity. And then secondly, they were in a spirit of prayer. Oh my goodness, this is my long coat. <laughs> I could really spend all the time on this right here. We need time alone, but we need time together too. Our corporate prayers, listen to this now, Holy Ghost gave me this many years ago. Our corporate prayers are no better than our pri private prayer life. That's why we encourage people to pray in tongues all the way to the meeting, right Papa? Actually all the time. Because if you pray in the Spirit, it helps you get into the Spirit and into the unity of the Spirit so that when you get to the corporate meeting, you see, then you're in the, in the Spirit to be in unity with what God is doing. And many times you will get what the person with the microphone is going to say even before they say it, if you're in that realm, in the spirit. So that spirit of prayer, okay? Now, 
Intimacy is a key. Into me see. You're saying it to God. God, I want intimacy with you. I want you to see into me. And, and to be open and not ashamed, to be naked and not ashamed before the Lord, to be uh, uh, not at fault. You know, Satan comes, but can he find anything in you? Jesus said he's come, but he couldn't find anything in me. So intimacy is a key component to our prayer life. We need to open our hearts to God, allowing him to capture, I like that word, capture our attention. I see a, I see a cowboy right now, Papa. I see a, uh, I see a cowpoke with a lasso. And he's throwing the lasso out. He's capturing somebody's attention. <laughs> he's drawing it around that little doggie and pulling him up. You know, he's running away, you know. Little calf is running away. And, and the cowboy just lassos that little doggie and pulls him up, captures him, and brings him to attention. Hallelujah. You see that? That's a visual for you. And this is what, this is what God is allowing the Holy Spirit to do to us. Mm. And prayer time is so important. We must take time to listen, to be open and to receive, and then, of course, to obey. Um, in my book, Prophetic Third Day Intercession, I wish I had a copy so I could show it to you, but I didn't bring one with me this time. I talk about the importance of listening with the intent to obey. Why do we, why do we ask God to speak to us unless we intend to obey him? Amen? So this is what I got just before I came to the pulpit tonight. This is what God says. When we speak, God bends low. When we speak, God bends low to hear us and to respond to our prayers. So we could expect, can expect him to respond to us because he, he has the, the desire to hear our prayers. That's why he bends low. Um, I can't think of the Greek word right now, but that's what it means, that God actually bends low. Could you think of it, Papa? Scriptures promise us that if we know that he hears us, this is in 1 John 5, if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions of the things that we ask him for, right? And this is confidence, isn't it? Isn't that, doesn't that give you confidence to know that when you pray, that one who is bending low to hear, to listen. <laughs> I wish my husband would bend low to listen sometimes. I know you, I heard you out there. I heard you women, I heard you say, you wish your husband would, mm-hmm. I wasn't saying that about Al, I, I was just repeating what you're thinking. Got myself out of that one, didn't I? <laughs> so the next one, number three says, they were receptive to the teachings of the scripture. I mean, it's one thing to go to Sunday school, it's one thing to be taught the scripture, it's one thing to have Bible study uh, together or even alone, but to be receptive to the teaching. I'm giving you some adjectives tonight that uh, are descriptive. Peter expounded the Old Testament teachings to them, and we must receive his word. It's not just enough to hear it. We must receive it. Let it become a part of us. Amen? The word is exalted. The word In Old Testament, it says God's word is exalted even above his name. Woo! And we know how high is his name. His name is above every other name. But his word is even higher than his name. Hallelujah. Woo. Mm. The Holy Scriptures are our guidebook for life. We cannot live a successful life without the guidance of God's word. Listen to this. One day I was just walking through the house, just minding my business, you know. <laughs> Taking care of my little household duties. And this is what the Holy Ghost said to me. My word is forever settled in heaven. It needs to be settled in you. That's what he said. Oh, thank God. He hadn't said that to me in a long time, but that was probably in the 70s when I first started walking with him. You know, his word is not up for debate, but it's for correction and guidance and instruction in righteousness. And we need to eat the word. You eat three meals a day, but how often do you eat the word? Mm. Who said, was it Job said, I, I found the word and I ate it? And it was like, what? Who said he ate the word? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Wow. How many of you have eaten the word lately? Sometimes the word is bitter. It's hard. It's a hard word, isn't it? But we have to learn to chew it and, and digest it and let it work in us. Amen. And then number four, they were waiting patiently, expectantly for God to act. Mm. We expect things instantly. <laughs> Even using my word now, I have to be careful not to 
cause people to just say, you know, they want their prayers answered right now, you know. Uh, we expect things instantly. And listen to this. It's not mine. I, don't, I can't give credit because I don't know who said it. But man is into microwaving, but God is into marinating. You like that? Maybe God's trying to get our attention by waiting, by causing us to wait. I know, for instance, when we travel so much, particularly when you travel on land, even, even when we travel in the air, sometimes we'll be delayed and we'll have to wait a little while. And then we find out there was a storm up ahead or we just missed an accident. There's always a reason for waiting. So sometimes we have to learn to wait patiently, right? But also expectantly, right? The will of God is never exactly as we expect it to be. And I have a reference here of the life of Elizabeth Elliot. How many of you are familiar with Elizabeth Elliot? She was a contemporary writer, and she faced a lot of tragedy in her life. Her first year on the mission field in Ecuador, there were three major blows. The first one was the informant helping her with the language was murdered. Whew. All of, and the secondly, her, all of her written materials in a language never written before were stolen. Number three, the station on which her fiance, Jim Elliott, was working went down the river. All things were disastrous, big blows. And now, then years later, after many tragedies, including the murder after they were married, the murder of her husband, Jim Elliott, by the Acas, A-U-C-A-S, and the death of her second husband, even her second husband. Many other trials, she still has a tra had a track record of waiting on God. She said this, When I was 12, I told the Lord to work out his will in my life. I didn't think it was going to be that way. We never do, do we? I once heard David Wilkerson say that he asked God once why his life had been so difficult. And God answered, I brought you the easiest way you'd come. Hmm. Ouch. I wonder what he's going to say to me someday, Al, when I ask him the same question. I brought you the easiest way you would come. The will of God is never what we expect it to be. It may be it may seem to be much worse, but in the end, it's going to be a lot bigger and a lot greater than we can imagine. Because God has promised that our end is going to be greater than our beginning. Amen? It's our posture. And I ask us tonight, I ask myself as well, is our posture one of being together on a regular basis, of waiting upon the Lord, of praying, trusting Him, in his time, to fulfill his promises according to his will? That's a question. Is that our posture? We find other postures that quench the Spirit of God in our lives, and these are the ones that, these are the things that deter us and take our focus and keep us off our track. I remember God spoke to Al and me about 15 years ago, and he said, keep your eyes on Jesus Stay focused. Don't turn to the left or the right. This was right before 911. So when it happened, it was like <laughs> God had already spoken that to us. And the first words out of my mouth was, This has not taken God by surprise. And we try to keep our focus, didn't we? We find that newspaper tells us of, of people who are hiring experts to come into their houses to check out the energy balance in their homes and offices. People who are hungry for power. We're talking about the secular world. This article, uh, the article I was reading, described a, 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 a situation, a, a practice called Feng Chu. I think that's how you pronounce it. F-E-N-G-H-S-H-U-I. Huh? Feng Shui. Well, however. Practice, and, and this person is practicing this, and uh, it costs hundreds of dollars an hour. And they will stroll through your home and tell you what to add or take away through your home to give it more energy. The, this kind of priest comes into your house and arranges items and moves doors and puts up mirrors and all sorts of things to manipulate so that you can achieve good chi. 
It's an endeavor to attract good spirits and repel evil ones. My God. Universities uh, are having classes to teach this. One of the priests claims, his claim to fame was that he had being chewed the White House for President Clinton. The posture of receiving God's power is not through such pagan exercises as Feng Shu and astrology and palm reading or fortune telling. These are not God's ways. It is by gathering together with brothers and sisters in Christ in a spirit of prayer with a Bible and an open heart that's waiting and respect, receptive to God's guidance. Amen. Number three, the picture of Pentecost. There were three feasts that every male, I've already mentioned these, there were three feasts that every male, every Jewish male living within 20 miles of Jerusalem was legally bound to attend every year. Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now the word we're, uh, one we're studying tonight, Pentecost means 50. And another name for it is the Feast of Weeks. Seven weeks, and then the next day was the 50th day after Passover. Passover was usually in the middle of April, and this would make Pentecost the beginning of June. Some say even more people came to the Feast of Pentecost than they did to Passover. And as I studied it, I noticed that there were two main significant things about the feast, these two feasts, that uh, the first one commemorated the giving of the law at Sinai, and the second one was of agricultural significance. Well, actually, both of them were ag agricultural significance. At Passover, the fo first omer of barley of the crop was to be offered unto God as a first fruits, right? And at Pentecost, two barley loaves were offered in gratitude for a completed and gath in gathered harvest. So, see, it was the beginning and then for harvest. No work was to be done because it was a holy day, holy unto the Lord. Streets were filled with the people. And Luke paints this picture of Pentecost for us in Acts 2. This is the one we're so familiar with. Chapter 2, verse 2 through 13, and I'll read. And suddenly, say suddenly, don't you love the suddenlies of God? And suddenly there was, there came a sound from heaven as a, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. I like to think of myself as being the house. Rushing mighty wind, come and fill this house. <laughs> Whoa! Hallelujah. Verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat upon each one of them. And they were all, say all. all. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And by the way, while I'm giving this teaching, you just go ahead and receive and just begin speaking in tongues right now. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, number one, it, there was a sound from heaven. It was like a mighty rushing wind, it said. I love Mel Torrey, you know, he, from Indonesia. He wrote the book, Like a, a Mighty Wind. We've had the privilege of meeting him and being in meetings with him at least twice now. Uh, it, when he first came to America back in 1972, I think, and then just about five years ago, we met him again in Florida, 35 years later. Hallelujah. He's still going, still going strong, still telling his story. And that was really quite a story. If you haven't read that book, I invite you to get it. Go to your library or go to uh, online and, and, and order it. Like a Mighty Wind. It's a powerful book. Mel Torrey. I don't mean Mel Torrey. Is that his name, Mel Torrey? That's... Oh, thank you, Lord. The wind has been a type of the Holy Spirit for the Hebrew people for a long time. And here's a reference for you. Ezekiel chapter 37. And then remember when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus there in John chapter 3, he talked about the wind. In the upper room, the wind was blowing, rushing with a force. God was bringing to life his church, giving birth to the church. And then the next picture after, after the wind was tongues of fire appeared on their heads. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each one of them. It was burning but not consumed, right? Like the bush that Moses saw in the wilderness, right? Burning but not consumed. Whew. Wow. Did you ever get that revelation? Burning but not consumed. Now, I tell you, I want to be burning, but I want to be consumed, but I don't want to be totally consumed. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I do want to be consumed by the Holy Spirit, but not totally burned up, right? Does that make sense? Okay. 
The fire of the Holy Ghost purges and burns away the chaff. That's what I'm talking about. And all that keeps us from becoming what God has created us to be. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, burn. Say, burn, Jesus, burn. Burn, Holy Ghost, burn in us. Burn the chaff. Burn it, Lord. Send your fire and burn. We want the Holy Ghost and the fire. Burn and purge and burn away the chaff and everything that keeps us from becoming what you have created us to be. Burn, burn, burn. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Consume us, Lord. Consume us for your purposes. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost refines us, Malachi 3, 3. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and shall, and shall purge, there's that word again, purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. Isn't that what we want to be? We want to be on the altar. Someone asked Marianne Brown one time uh, why there's no smoke of God's presence in the church today. And she, her answer was, because there's no fire on the altar. And that's us. We are the ones to be on the altar, right? And, and, and declaring and crying out to God as we just did. Fire, we want to be burned. Burn us on that altar, Lord. Burn us. Let us be the altar. Let us be the, the sacrifice. And then the third picture is that of speaking in other terms, the uh, tongues. The wind, uh, the fire, and then speaking in tongues. The Holy Ghost propels, propels us. There's another good word. A good, I love verbs. He propels us beyond our abilities. Mm. I'm still on the fire. His fire purifies us to become more like him. And he enables us to communicate the gospel beyond our abilities. Glory to God. This gift, this gift of tongues has twofold. The Holy Ghost had me insert this this afternoon. This gift is twofold. Number one, it's our prayer language that we have the power to engage whenever we choose to pray. I make this clear distinction now because it took me three years to understand this clearly. The second is the gift of tongues, which is listed in 1 Corinthians 12 in the nine manifestation gifts of the Spirit. The gift of tongues operates only as the Spirit, the Holy Spirit chooses. Remember now, your prayer language, you can choose to pray whenever you want to, as you will. But the gift of tongues and I'll describe that a little more. The gift of tongues, which is one of the spiritual gifts, only operates as the Holy Spirit wills, as he chooses, and it is for a specific purpose. Okay, for instance, and I ran this through Papa again this, today to make sure I had this clear. For instance, to convert the unbeliever, to demonstrate the presence of God, and to build us up when the tongues are interpreted. Before we started traveling to the nations, we had meetings in our home. I want to share this with you. It makes it clear. One night, we were in a circle praying, and I began to speak in a tongue that was unknown to me. I had never spoken in this tongue before, and I was praying, and two of the young ladies in the circle began to cry. They were sisters, and they told me that I was praying for their brother who was still in Iran. The mother and father had escaped and had come to America with the two sisters, but their brother was still in Iran. And the Holy Ghost anointed me with the gift of tongues to pray for this young man. Now, a man who had been a soldier in Iran confirmed that I had spoken in their language. Now, that is the gift of tongues. And I could give you several other instances, but that was the one the Holy Spirit chose for me to use tonight. So that's as the Holy Spirit gift uh, is as he chooses. But your prayer language, you can pray right now. Just go ahead and pray in your language. You can do it as you choose, right? Hallelujah. So choose more often, my challenge to you. Number four, the purpose of Pentecost. Well, this is pretty clear, isn't it? Acts 1.8, I've already read this tonight, but you shall receive that power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And why? What shall happen then? We, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So what is it now? To it be endued with power from on high, to be witnesses, and to have the power to act on behalf of Christ. Then to have the authority to trample all the ability of the enemy 
and nothing shall be able to harm you. That's Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Papa and I have been using this verse the last week, particularly, right, Durham? I'll come and say it again. Here's this word again. I give you the power, which means the authority. Exousio. I give you the, the Greek word is exousio. I give you the authority to trample over all the ability of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means harm you. And then another reason is to fulfill the Great Commission, to go into all the world and make disciples, Matthew 28, which is also just a confirmation of what the Acts scripture I just read. So that's the purpose of Pentecost, isn't it? You want me to run through those again? Okay, hang on. All right, to be endued with power from on high, to be witnesses, to have the power to act on behalf of Christ, to have the authority to trample all the ability of the enemy, to fulfill the Great Commission, to go into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples. Hallelujah. Are we doing this? Wow. I don't know about you, but this lesson really challenged me. Okay, let's get to the fifth one now, the practice of Pentecost. John described this experience of Luke being filled with the Holy Ghost as rivers of living water. I like to think of this because at our age, you know, the enemy would like to dam you up <laughs> and stop your flow. Come on now, get with me here now. Come on. So John says that in the last day, how many of are there? We're in the last days, right? That great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And then he said, <laughs> verse 38, John 7, He that believeth on me, do you believe on him? If you don't believe on him tonight, now is a good time. I invite you to come to believe on Lord Jesus Christ. As the scripture has said, out of his belly, say, out of my belly, will flow rivers of living water. Rivers. Prophesy it. Out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water. I'm not a dam. I'm a river. Hallelujah. So keep on drinking. My challenge to us tonight is keep on drinking. I was doing um, a revival. God was using me in Tennessee one time to, uh, to bring revival meetings there. And as I arrived to the church that night, uh, one of the greeters said to me, How are you doing, Sister Billy? And out of my mouth came, I'm drunk and still drinking. <laughs> Isn't that a good declaration? Isn't that a good confession? Let's say it together. I'm drunk and still drinking. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Out of my belly said that. <laughs> Paul said, one baptism, but many fillings. So how are we to be filled continually? How are we to be filled continually? All right. Dr. Bill Bright helped me with this one. Do not, number one, this is important one, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm only going to give these to you. Number two, get rid of the sin in your life. <laughs> Number three, spend time daily in prayer and Bible study. Number four, be in the Word and walk in the Spirit, walk in, filled with the Spirit. Number five, obey God's commandments. Hallelujah. Obey God's commandments. And number six, witness for Christ. If you've not received the Holy Ghost baptism right now, I'm asking you, Jesus to fill you right now. Jesus, I ask you right now, fill everyone who's crying out to you right now. John said that he baptized with water, but the one was coming after him would baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And then after you're baptized, then let's seek to be filled with his spirit because the promise is to you now. Pentecostal power. Amen.